Come awesome. On. Awesome. We're just gonna trust you on that because yeah, I'm, I'm... it all looks the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If we're not live, then we'll just be chatting to ourselves. Hi everyone. Uh, this is the uh, panel for designing and publishing with ADHD. Uh, my name is Jay Dragon. Uh, I don't use pronouns. I am a queer disabled game designer with ADHD uh, who works at Possum Creek Games. Uh, uh. Rob, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hey, I'm Rob Donahue, uh, he, him. I am uh, one of the founders of Evil Hat. I write odds and ends uh, around gaming stuff. Uh, I've got ADHD and uh, either ironically or very logically do project management and agile stuff in my, my daytime existence. Um, and Rabbit. I am Rabbit Stoddard. Um... My pronouns are anything but it, honestly. Um, also have ADHD. I do a bunch of writing and designing for various indie stuff. Most recently, uh, Talisman Adventures Role Playing and Brain Realities. Um, I also have anxiety. And interestingly, I also spend my time doing uh, agile and project management and tools management stuff for tech companies in my daily life. And uh, Darla. My name is Darla Burrow. My pronouns are she and her. I am a relatively new designer, but I ran a successful Kickstarter earlier this year for a game called Dear Great Cthulhu. Please stop oh. giving me superpowers, which just went live for general says on itch. But I also made a bunch of one page games like Basic and Bizarre, Bury Me in Starlight, and Vampire Roommate. Mm. I am autistic, have a DHD, and use a speech generating device to communicate. Also, fair warning that my adult cat, the Floof, is currently battling my 14 week old kitten for dominance, so they may put in an appearance. I think anyone Wonderful. will object. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself? Lucas, introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Lucas. I'm helping facilitate this panel. I'll be popping in with questions every so often, as well as putting things in the chat, which I was just fighting against, which is why I'm a bit slow here. <laughs> no worries. Uh, yep, wonderful. And also a big thank you to Joe, who's, uh, who's making this all go. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, wonderful. So I guess maybe the best place to start here is... Um, how does i guess like cut to the chase how does adhd impact our designs like to you how does adhd impact the work you do as a designer player publisher like any of the work you do i feel like that that alone will kind of carry us through <laughs> sure. well and i i'm gonna say i think i actually expect some very different answers because mm -hmm. uh I, i'm very much in the adhd gives you superpowers camp but it's uh, <laughs> a kind of a crapshoot as to which superpowers it gives you mm -hmm. um and uh, I know God knows uh, that do it. Hyper focus is wonderful for producing a draft. Um, it's uh -huh. it's amazing, and there are absolutely things that uh, the ADHD hyper focus has resulted in getting cranked out in a weekend. But uh -huh. you know, then the flip side being uh, to to get all Regina Specter, it's easy to write but not edit. Mm -hmm. Oh, also, mm -hmm. if you can get started on it in the first place, yes, <laughs> get it yes, that for it's, sure. The cannon's got to be pointed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I often, uh, my, I, my rule for myself is that if I don't have, like, the emotional energy to write something, then it, it is not worth struggling to try and write. So I will, like, regularly be like, oh, you know, this whole central mechanical conceit, I'm going to sum it up in a couple sentences, and if I need to, I will maybe come back to it later. Or... I won't, and maybe that's just where the game is at. Like, <laughs> and sometimes things just are a little pat patchwork. Yeah, I'm oh. typically in that camp because most of what I do mm -hmm. is freelance or um, uh, write mm -hmm. for hire kinds of stuff, mm -hmm. which um, which is a struggle because a lot of it is relatively tight deadlines and very little outline whatsoever, and. Um, Mm -hmm. A thing that can drive me nuts about that is you'll have five or six people writing different chapters in a book that are that should be laid out relatively similarly, and we all do it differently. 
and how, um, how do you how do you navigate freelance with ADHD? Because I cannot do freelance. I can't even be a stretch goal on a Kickstarter. I I don't write for other people. <laughs> um, how do you do it? In fits and starts, and it was a lot easier before there was a pandemic. Honestly, uh, it took me the better part of the year to get my last project for Talisman done and i've got two more that i need to work on and is the first year that i ever actually flaked on something but nine times out of ten it's about what you'd expect um i throw a bunch of ideas in the first few days i get them down on paper i completely forget about it for the next two months and then the last week of the project i get the whole thing done and it usually works out uh that's been a lot harder in the last year but um but it, it's in a thing that works for me more or less because mm -hmm. blind panic dopamine for the win <laughs> well, part of the issue with, with adhd is yep. difficulty prioritizing tasks so mm -hmm. uh, it feels like exhausting or moving a mountain until the deadline becomes close enough that uh, your brain shoots it up to the top of the priority chart mm -hmm. i am super curious about darla and the one page games especially um, mm -hmm. Because I'm curious how those two things interact from your perspective. Mm -hmm. Affects my design in weird and complicated ways. I write in stops and starts. Either I am super into writing and pump out 5,000 words without really realizing it, or I struggle to get a couple words out, and there is no middle ground. Yes. That's deeply familiar. My brain circling around getting things lined up until things are perfect. Then procrastinate for months, because I cannot get it together to write the whole damn thing. For instance, this week I had to release my game before Megatopia, so after two months of no work I completed it in the course of three hours. Oh yeah, Complete I feel relatable. you. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm, I'm curious, so relatable. for me, um, small games are a challenge because I, I deal with my own stress around things by just writing more. So trimming down, I like I have such respect for, for the ability to put out a small, tight, focused game because I am way too sprawling for that. And I'm wondering if that feels more natural to you or if you've got a secret trick. Because if you've got a secret trick, I want it. Same. The project I flaked on, in fact, was a 1200 word game that I just could not. I had a couple of core things and I just could a 6, not. A 6,000 word game? In. A 6,000 word game would be fine. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, there's, like, a, there's a quote that's like, I would have written you an, a shorter letter if I had the time. And I think yeah. about that all the goddamn time. <laughs> that's like the yep. quote in my mind. Mm hmm. Yeah. <laughs> When we were um... one pagers, it really depends. Either I write it in an hour or I write it in a week. But it is fighting my own desire to develop things more. So I have a zine game I am working on now that started as a 500 word project and is not 8,000 words. I have to pare down everything. Uh, All right, I feel you. I was I'm I was hoping you had a silver yeah. bullet, but. <laughs> uh, hey everyone, I am so so sorry to do this. I just huh? got. Uh, really bad. I, I got a, a really worrying text from my mom, and I think go. I have to go. Go, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. prioritize it. Don't Thank sweat you. it. Yes, good luck with the rest of the panel. Good Take thoughts. care, everyone. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. no. um, we have some people in chat. Oh, we have some people in chat wondering about talking about hyper focus and yep. how it's great for creation but it's really a struggle when you have multiple things to get done or when you have something you need to get done and you're focused on something else and so yep. kind of wondering about how you kind of manage both the good that comes with hyper focus but the hyper focus that comes with hyper focus badly yeah for, uh, for me hyper focus is great if i can get over the starting hurdle because well, Executive dysfunction typically comes along with ADHD. It's probably my main curse as yeah. far as it goes. So uh, I am just as likely to hyper-focus on anything else around me. A video game, a book, cleaning. We all know the, well, I could be doing this writing thing or I could be like obsessively cleaning my house kind of problem. Um, once I actually get writing... The problem is, especially if you're putting together a whole game, 
which is the other problem I had with the, you know, doing a full 1200 word game is you can't neglect any of the pieces of it from starting middle, you know, mechanics that are repeatable. So you hyper focus on character creation, none of the rest of it gets done for months. Because you've used all your energy on one small piece and burned out on even looking at the rest of it. At least that's how I struggle. Have I figured out how to get past that? Mm, not so much. I, I try to outsmart myself a little. Oh, you got some, Charlie? Cool. Um. But I, I'll I'll go and then hand off the uh, the thing that um, I I one of the ways I deal with it is I just write a lot and like one of the things that distracts me from writing is often writing, um, but I write a lot and keep enough of a writing habit that uh, it then becomes sort of a game of numbers. Um, eventually, the thing I'm pointed at is the thing I'm supposed to be writing. And so it ends up working out. Uh, the other thing I do is uh, having recognized some of the things that I'm more likely to be distracted by, I change my tool sets. Um, I write almost exclusively in uh, text and markdown these days because if I am writing in anything that has any formatting capability, uh, then there is a very good chance that I am not writing, I am fiddling with layout. Um, and not even realizing that I have shifted gears. And then four hours later, I, I discover that no words have been made, but boy, have I looked at a lot of fonts. Mm-hmm. Mm. Actually, that's one of the reasons why doing freelance is very nice. The formatting is not my problem. Nice. I should never be worried about the formatting. Uh, some projects will tell you, do not format a single thing. Just do yep large text blocks and that really really helps in keeping focused on that managing hyper focus is counterproductive it just sort of happens i cannot control it but the flip side is i suddenly become angry and spend an hour trying to figure out the right word to use to put things together in chunks as i write them i have a whole separate document where i put together those chunks and a second where I actually organize them. I've tried writing a book as an actual book, but it was hard as hell and I kept getting sidetracked. But for something like Dear Great Cthulhu, I wrote it on my phone, then wrote it in chunks in a notes document, then wrote it in a manuscript, then finally actually put together the actual layout of where things go. Yeah. Yeah. Ordering things, uh, I mean, I used to hate lay, uh, uh, outline or outlining things because it just felt like busy work and stuff. But uh, as I get older and the whole scope of the thing is less and less in my head. All in the head at once, yeah. Yeah. Then doing a quick bullet point list um, can be very helpful. If I'm not going to get any words out anyway, at the very least, I can set up some signposts against the time when I can, in fact, uh, write words that might actually get used. This is a reason a lot of people like Scrivener, um, because it's, uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, Scrivener is a piece of software that is really designed for writing books. It's got, you know, a little bit of word processing capability, but its big thing is that it's for writing lots of chunks of things and sorting them and keeping them organized and moving them around and throwing your research notes and stuff in. Um, Where a book or a writing thing is approached more like a project with lots of pieces rather than like one monolithic thing as it tends to be if you like write it all in a Word doc. Um, And for a lot of folks, that's just a lot more natural and intuitive. And by a lot of folks, I mean like brains like ours. I think the outline also helps avoid the other problem, which is just forgetting things. I cannot trust that if I come up with an idea or a title or whatever, I will actually remember it later. hundred yes. percent. Absolutely. Uh, so it, it, in a brief sidebar, uh, for me, the uh, David Allen's getting things done uh, system was like transformational. 
Um, and uh, not necessarily because of the specifics of the system, but the, one of the tenets is your brain is really bad at keeping track of things. So maybe don't use your brain for that. Mm -hmm. um, put it put it in systems put it in systems that you can trust uh and i find the same thing is true of these projects is like yeah i've got all these ideas and like and unfortunately like at the moments when i'm in that big brain space where i'm pulling it all together i think i'm going to remember it all i think it's crystal clear and it's obvious and i'm not going to have any problems and i've learned not to trust myself mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well for for me like I will sometimes I'll want to use notebooks and I'll try to keep a consistent notebook. Um, like everything I had at Metatopia two years ago, I had in one notebook with a white erase on the back of it. It was wonderful. Yep. And then it got to, towards the end of that notebook. And that's a very oh, dangerous God. time when you're switching oh, notebooks. Yep. And, um, and I had notes for a thing that I spent two months looking for because I was like, no, I had it. I can't redo it. I have to find my original notes. Uh, yep. If I can, using OneNote for me, like, because um, uh, Scrivener, extra expenditure, but OneNote I've been using oh, for OneNote a very, very long time. It's yep. very, very similar. And I can do chunks and pieces and I can move them around and I can have them reasonably organized or categorized in a way that makes sense to me and doesn't have to make sense to anybody else. Um, oh. Yep. And that last bit is key, is that um, just like the superpowers are very individual, the uh, the solutions are very individual. And yeah, it's good, Darla. I keep it all in my phone, but the problem is that sometimes I will write something amazing and genius, but I never gave it context. Or I thought that a short sentence would trigger a memory, and it yep. doesn't. Oh, uh, we, we laugh because, oh, God, we have all been that. You come back and you just have that note, that page that's got, like, one note on it. And that sentence, you like, I'm reading that, and I know I was thinking something then. And I think it was probably really good. Like, I remember thinking it was really good. What the hell was I thinking? Deeply <laughs> relatable. I, I've actually found notes that were, oh my god, this idea is really, really brilliant. I know exactly what to do. And then I didn't write anything else. So what about the opposite problem? I, I know I've, I've been using Notion personally because of the database functionality, right, being yeah. able to cross-reference things. But when you, have, when you have all of these you know, ideas and when you do remember them and suddenly you have so many ideas and they're all there and you're, the, it's never clear what to focus on, you get lost in them, you can't let lose any of them because they're all there in your mind and they stay there. How do you deal with that volume if you do succeed in saving it? Once again, the answer is badly. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I, I'll actually say, so the godsend for this is search. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 am a, I am a systems junkie, and I have over the years tried like 10 million different ways to keep this stuff organized. Uh, uh, personal wikis and uh, Zettelkasten and, uh, you know, everything under the sun to try to keep this stuff uh, organized and findable because... Yeah, no, I've I've got like that morbid fear that I will lose these great ideas. Um, but every system either runs into problems past a certain point or becomes such a distraction in and of itself that what you're doing is building the system and not doing the work. Um, and so I, I thank every power that can be for the fact that search has become so incredibly robust in even simple tools like Apple Notes or, or things like that. Um, if you don't have clean organization and hierarchy and structure, yeah, that might be a problem, but you can still find everything. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it depends on if it's- Five different sets of notes, but also yep. it means that I tend to stop everything else to make the notes. I often have trouble watching movies as a chunk because I will have ideas and they all need to be written down. Yes. I will sometimes just let things go. In order, because I'm in what I'm already in, and it'll go if it. And I use the butterfly thing. If it comes yep. back, it was meant to be. If it doesn't, it wasn't that big be, a deal. Because I always, because uh, I also always go through the. This is brilliant. This is awesome. And then I start working on it, and I'm like, oh, why did I think that would ever work? That oh. sucks. So oh. sparing myself a little bit of yep. that. 
But um, it also depends on, okay, is this something that I ever need to work on with somebody else? Or is this something that is just for me? Because if it's just for me, then a list of bullet points in a text document or in OneNote is fine. If it's something I might ever have to share with anyone else, then a wiki is usually better where I can invite someone and the structure might make a lick of sense at all. Um, I will also say that this is one of those, another one of those areas where the getting things done thing helped me because getting things done has a very strong habit of universal capture, like, the that you always have a means of capturing things and you've got some place where you put them and then what you do after that is your system uh, and you do it but like live with some way to take notes and capture things uh, mm -hmm. whether it's a, a notebook in your pocket or your phone or whatever exactly and if you have that habit then it goes somewhere and hopefully you can figure out what you do from there but that way you you never have the i i had a brilliant moment and i lost it i mean to the point where i i know people who literally got, get like the right and rain notebooks so they can keep them in the shower um, because for a lot of people that's where most of the ideas come up um and i'm like awesome more power to you i don't think i could do that so we've talked you've all uh, all three of you have talked a few times about systems and the things that work for you or alluded to them. And we've had several people in chat talking about the systems they need or the structure and accountability that they kind of need to have in place in order to get things done in various ways. So I'm wondering what systems, what account forms of accountability or structure have you all had set up for you, you know, relied on other people for, so on and so forth? Well, I mean, first and foremost, that it's not a coincidence that, that Rabbit and I are both in the project space. Um, one of the things I found, especially around Agile, is um, a lot of people, especially folks who uh, maybe didn't have a diagnosis or didn't have a diagnosis until late in life, have built up a lot of systems and a lot of coping skills and a lot of the meta skills about testing these systems and using them. Um, and that skill set, as it turns out, is exactly the skill set you want to run a project. Um, so from a meta perspective, there's, uh, there's a strong connection between those two things. So this is just for me to say out there, hey, uh, Agile's a great path for, for all you young ADHDers who are, who are looking for, for a career direction. Um, yeah. And I mean, my skill set's primarily Scrum Master, so I'm usually putting myself in the position of helping other people um, organize their work or at least have a clear space in which to work, um, which sort of backhandedly helps me because I get to see what works for them and what doesn't. And the constant reminder that, hey, what works for me isn't necessarily gonna work for other people. I can I can give tools, but I can see what the barriers to adoption are. Like, um, as for, I mean, in freelancing, I work primarily with and for other people. So I rely on them a lot to let me know, hey, what are the deadlines? What's oh, really God. important and there to you go. The that is the single best tool is a friend who's more organized than you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or, or somebody to whom, you know, this is a thing that matters for them and they will uh, at, at least let me know what I need to hit and what I need to hit in what order and what is most important to them right now. It also boosts things on the priority level because if I know someone's waiting on something for me, it tends, my brain tends to go, well, that's more important than whatever else it is that yep. I wanted to do. People pleasing. Yep, good. Now the accountability yeah. system. His name is Kevin Petker. He edited <laughs> my most recent game and he is my game design buddy. Having a design buddy is good for keeping you accountable. And my creeping existential dread that I have things that need to be done, then the dread reaches a peak, and I do something and the dread goes away. This is not a good coping strategy. Do not rely on creeping existential dread for accountability. Yeah. Yeah, no. For yeah. at Evil Hat, there's there's a reason that uh, if if Sean were not keeping things on track, the wheels would come off the bus so fast. Um, 
And he does all the right things. He keeps things visible. He keeps regular checks in. He does accountability. It's non-judgmental. It's just that there is a constant level of engagement. And non-judgmental is really important because mm -hmm. uh, it's worth noting that ADHD frequently goes hand in hand with rejection sensitivity. Um, yes. And uh, it is very, very easy to, one of the things that is most paralyzing about being late on something is you are late by a day, therefore you are trash and they hate you and they never want your work ever again and they would just rather you go in a hole and die, so why even continue? Um, <laughs> strangely, a little bit of an anti-pattern. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. I am fortunate in that I am married to my game design buddy um who who is who also you know has his own struggles but is still uh better organized than me in, in that um uh he finds it much easier to consistently work but he sets a good example for me and we if we can talk something out like my project or his project it usually helps because it puts me more in the space to actually make something uh, come back to tools. One of the things I will call out is, uh, and this feeds back into the project management thing, is tools are great. Uh, I love them. I got a million of them. Um, that itself is kind of a problem. Uh, and that is because, at least for me, um, I can build a system that will totally work and it will work for a while. Uh, and then I will become blind to it because it loses novelty and it is no longer interesting. Um, and so honest to God, one of my coping strategies is I have about six different methodologies for keeping track of my work, ranging from different task softwares to Kanban to physical notebooks to other things. And I change them on a fairly irregular basis. Um, and for a time, I used to think that this was just wasteful uh, fisking kind of kind of work on my part. Um, yak shaving, if, if people are familiar with the term. Um, but uh, in practice, it refreshes the processes in my mind, and novelty is such a key thing for keeping the ADHD brain engaged uh, that it keeps the systems functional. And so I just treat the transition between systems as kind of a, a little bit of overhead to keep them functional. One of the nice things about being a tool is so. Currently, I'm an Atlassian administrator, an enterprise systems administrator. So part of my work is changing up the tool constantly for different people's needs, which I, I think now that you mentioned it, is satisfying that yeah. need for novelty uh, in, in the actual tools and systems. It scratches the itch. You know what I'm saying? I've been like writing SQL in Confluence lately, uh, I, which is like one of the most insane things a human being can do. but I have, I have engages. very little to say about that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, there's a specific of, plugin. So, go ahead. I was just, in terms of uh, tools, we have a question from Genesis of Legend asking about the, if there's a tangible difference between paper versus electronics tools for U3. Uh, Jason's totally mm -hmm. laying up the, uh, the remarkable, but uh, go ahead, Darla. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I run a learning management system, so hilariously I have the tools to ride herd on other people, but not myself. <laughs> there you go. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yes, there's a difference. Yes, I lose all th use all three. I have a Remarkable. Uh, uh, for the which... unfamiliar, a Remarkable is a, an e-ink tablet that has as close to a paper-like writing experience as you can get with something electronic these days. Uh, it's pretty magical. It's also expensive. Uh, yeah. I, I use it for my character sheets these days, actually. It's really good for character sheets. Uh, I have a one of these things with the day planner yep. that has individual tasks. Uh, for work and myself, whenever I come up with them, and I use uh, OneNote and a Kanban board in Jira uh, that I use intermittently, but mostly for work. So they're very, very different. But uh, even though there's some overlap between them, I find them all relatively necessary. Yep. And as noted for me, part of it is the changing up between things. Uh, the single greatest use of paper is, for me is when I need to forcibly get myself separated from distractions um, because 
ultimately the problem is uh, I can try to be focused on an iPad or a computer or something like that, but the opportunities for things that I can do other than work are often a little bit too high for me. Um, if all I've got is a notebook and a pen, um, then it is very hard to do anything but doodle ideas. And maybe they're going to be the wrong ideas, but when I'm at the point in a project where what I need to be doing is creating and coming up with stuff, paper is is magical uh, for me. But then later on, I need to get away from it because paper is terrible for reorganizing stuff unless you're like working in index card size segments, which I try to whenever possible because I love index cards. But um, yeah. Well, and restricting the editing yep. phase in part to yep. yeah to uh, when I'm retyping it up can yep. can help. Perfect, Darla. Uh, don't put things on paper unless there is no other option. I have dysgraphia for writing more than a sentence yep. is hard and painful. If I just have a notebook, nothing will get done or written down. Typing lets me get everything out. I am typing right now to tell you this. <laughs> yep. No, no. And I, the, the, the irony, uh, for me, it, there is, there is a, I, I think I kind of, uh, got brute forced through, uh, dysgraphia. It scatters across my family and my kid is getting, ha getting handled for it much more effectively than I ever was as a kid. Um, and so, uh, cause at, when I was a kid, it wasn't dysgraphia. It was just terrible handwriting. Um, and that, that's, uh, that, that's unfortunate, but that's the nature of a bunch of these things. Um, but, my handwriting is still atrocious, um, but I also have made my piece that it's for me. The counterpoint being is that my typing is also atrocious. Um, so oh. I, I'm in a kind of lose-lose proposition there. I'm like, and, and my typing should be better. I know how to touch type, but literally I think I've spent 20 years knowing that what I really need to do is sit down and spend two months just dedicatedly touch typing. But the slowdown that it would require from my faster but radically inaccurate typing has been just too painful to embrace. Yeah. I, I have also have a love hate relationship with physical writing because for the um, almost Satori like way where I just start writing and then eventually I get to the right thing and pull it out similar to what you described, Rob. Yep. Um, physical writing is often better, but uh, I get horrible hand cramps or it starts hurting badly after a while. I've been trying to reacclimate myself to it because I used to write, like, when I was working retail, I would be writing on wrapping paper behind the counter. Uh, I was much younger and less crampy then. But, uh, um... Well, we're also now in, like, the world where the ubiquitous phone is an option, and I'm, I'm so jealous of... Uh, the, the folks who who have that because I'm like it is everything I wanted when like Palm was new and exciting yeah um, like I, I I bought like the whole rig to be able to use a keyboard on a Palm 5 um, because I'm like oh this is amazing and I cannot tell you the number of gadgets I have bought over the years to be able to just write in strange places. Um, I've I've still got an Alpha Smart in the closet, and I still bust it out, and it's um, still absolutely amazing. And for folks who are unfamiliar, Alpha Smart did a series of devices that are basically just a really nice keyboard and a little tiny screen that's maybe two inches high and six or seven inches wide that's just LCD and it does not do anything but let you write. Like the way you get get text off it is not a file transfer. You plug it in, it acts as a keyboard driver and it will just type the content of whatever you have on it into your software. It is, mm. if if you are someone who needs a keyboard, but also wants a, like the truest distraction-free writing environment, uh, an Alpha Smart is just amazing. They're super out of business, but like you can find them for like 40 bucks on eBay these days. And it's, they're, they're really neat. Stop making me feel old, Rob. <laughs> I, I used to, um... When I was in high school, I had a graphing calculator that you could sort of put notes and text in. I definitely did that, but I had an old yep. boss who had one of those things, except you could email it. So I did a whole bunch of word processing on it and emailed it to myself. Yes. I, I think that's the rub is like there's uh, 
there are times and places like you'll find a way to write. Writing finds a way. Um, and we just happen to live in a, in a world now where those ways perhaps don't require quite as much cheating as they used to. And that's fantastic. Yeah. Now, I will sometimes get hung up on, I have so many options for what to write in or that uh, yep. I can't get started because I'm like, well, is this better in OneNote? Is this better in a oh, document? Yep. Should I do it in Google Docs? Should I do it yep. in a notebook? If so, which notebook should I use? And I do book binding, so... Yep. Uh, Oh so yeah, that makes it even that. harder. And and which pen? Which pen? Bear in mind, you know, pen oh. selection is also super important. Um, yep, yep. All of these things invite distract passive distraction. Yep. I can't find my good pen, <laughs> so I guess I can't write now. Your format affects how and what you can write. Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I, I'll. Here's okay. Here's the thing. I don't think it actually affects things, but it tricks me into thinking it does. I I have bought fountain pens and they make me feel like a writer and that in turn makes me write more and creates a, this nice emotional feedback loop that feels kind of magical. And in reality, it's it's nonsense. I could do the exact same thing with a, a number two pencil or, or or whatever I happen to have on hand. But if getting that nice fountain pen and that nice notebook or that really good clicky mechanical keyboard or whatever thing is what makes you feel like a writer, then, I mean, again, to come back to the actual topic of this, um, that provides the emotional satisfaction that feeds a little AD, ADHD engine in my brain and gets me past the resistance. Um, and so, if so, money well spent. Um, now, that said, that doesn't mean there hasn't been money absolutely wasted on super, super shiny things that I thought would make a difference, got used twice, and are now in a drawer. Um, but we don't talk about those things. ADHD tax. <laughs> yes, ADHD tax, I love it. So we have a few questions from the chat. Uh, one, just we've talked a bit about writing, and we mentioned editing before, both how it's difficult and, of course, accountability, having others who assist. Uh, in adding on to that, how have you all overcome the editing hurdle, essentially? Uh, asked by Elio Tylan. Um. Paying for an editor is awesome. Actual yeah. editors. It is a skill set. It is an expertise. And like writing, it is something that anyone can technically do. But the value of having someone who actually does it is through the roof. Um, now, that also is based on size and I'm being possibly, I again, this is one of those areas where I really want Darla's take because of the one page games, because I don't know what editing is like for a one page game. Mm -hmm. um. uh, I, I work freelance, so other people are editing my work. Uh, that said, I do do an editing pass on my own work. I'm going to miss things, uh, writing fiction, you know, doing more editing. Yep. I, I, I have a little bit of an organizational brain where editing is soothing and yep. I'm not a terrible editor for others. Yep. I think Brent was pointing out recently, I'm a yep. good poetry editor. There you go. See, but, uh, this um, is also the value of the brain wandering away. One thing I will totally say is that because of that whole work on something, work on something, and then forget about it, um, it does make it easier to come back and read my own stuff with fresh eyes because I have no idea I even wrote this. Where where did this strange manuscript script on my drive come from? Um, and that's handy. Uh, the ability to sort of disassociate from myself um, can reap benefits if you're just willing to, you know, forget about projects and leave them in a drawer for two or three months at a time. Um, again, not a lifestyle choice I'd encourage, but, you know, one you can absolutely leverage. I have to answer this question in two different ways. I'm also an editor. I worked freelance on the Molifo 3rd edition faction books for Wired Games as an editor, and I do editing for educational documents at work. I am great at that. I am on task, focused, and know what to say. I am absolute shit at editing my own stuff. I hate my own writing when I try to reread it for editing, so I tend to toss money at Kevin to edit it. I think yeah. it's a worthwhile investment. If you can afford any if you can afford any one thing at all, 
yep. uh, an editor is probably the yeah. thing I would get. Yeah. And to be I mean, very clear, yeah. you yeah. know, I'm I'm medicated for my ADD and anxiety, in spite of which, uh, a lot of these things are still struggles. Yep. And and if your if your particular ADHD superpower lines up well with editing, awesome. Mm -hmm. Like that is totally the case for some people that that kind of detailed dive into the text is exactly the way their brain is, is working. And they, they look at editing as in alignment with, with how they think. And if so, awesome. I am, I am super jealous because that, no, no, not, not even a little. Yeah. I get hung up on, especially if I'm editing like setting stuff or, or things I have a, um, consistency tick and i can tell you if you uh if you establish two different things in the same place or or anything like that i will zero in on whether this is similar whether this is different that is my one editing superpower uh getting the specific grammar or phrasing correctly or m dashes and n dashes as uh uh Especially when I was writing in in rain, Greg Stoltze has a issue with using "will do something," the the uh, yep. that form of of future and the the dashes thing. And I'm crap at noticing those, so I, I apologize to my editors and to Greg especially for all the times he's had to fix my like future perfect. Greg, Greg can cope. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, actually, it's not as fun as heck. Especially when I am editing for continuity, among other things, because I love lore and editing lets me use that. But I also enjoy the technicality of language, the flow and lyrics of it, and I find that the folks contracting me actually like that. Yeah, see, and that's that's fantastic, because there's the thing, it's the patterns. I like, people talk about... Um about hyperfocus and that's like the most obvious ADHD superpower but I have frequently seen that it also there there is this pattern matching component uh, that that people who have ADHD will have these conversations with each other that may sometimes make no sense to other people because they are jumping from thing to thing to thing and it seems utterly nonsensical to an observer but what they're just doing is running the conne the connection rails as they see them. Um, mm -hmm. And those connection rails are just very big. And, and and what that translates into practically depends for people. Like I know some people who, uh, because of their ADHD, they are the most devastating people imaginable in a first person shooter um, because they can keep track of the positions of everybody all the time because that's <laughs> where their brain takes it. Yeah. For me, and the thing that ends up dovetailing with, with RPGs is I am really good at the and therefore hypotheticaling out how systems work. Um, yeah. And that's super, super valuable. And again, all these things are not like they're unique to ADHD, but ADHD puts a, a tilt on them. And that's one thing, it's always hard to talk about ADHD because you say it to somebody and people say, uh, I've been distracted. I've had a hard time getting things done. I've, I've done these things. And I'm like, I get it. I get it. You don't have someone else's experience. And, it, and on paper, when you describe it, it sounds like the same thing. And I'll be honest, I, even as someone who, who, who's got this and has this diagnosis, there are a lot of elements of that that I could not make my own peace with until my own kid got diagnosed. And I could see it from the outside and look at what he was, was dealing with and struggling with. And I could finally contextualize some of the things that I myself was still both wondering what was experiential with me and some of which was like, we all have the baggage that like, oh, you know, you'd be great if you could just apply yourself um, yeah. and, the, and the 10,000 other things that uh, undiagnosed ADHD gets to hear growing up. Um, on that note, oh, we have a, a question, especially for Darla and Rabbit, given you've said you've worked as editors and so on. Uh, I mean, on one hand, how do you explain to people you are working with the things that you need assistance with or the things that work best for you in a way that doesn't sound like you need something more because it's just, hey, here's what works best for me. But on the other side, 
how do you as a publisher or editor wrangle slash support someone with ADHD, either freelancers or people on your team? How do you get over those communication barriers, either having it or working with someone who has it? Huh. So for me, when I'm editing somebody's stuff and my my principal thing when I edit stuff is it's usually poetry. So then you have to start up front with what are people looking for out of the editing? Because uh, if someone has rejection, sensitivity, dysphoria in general, they definitely have it about their poetry because it's very emotional. Um, and this is... and. And there is a uh, a belief that game poetry is universally bad. Um, and I write good game poetry, and I've seen people write good game poetry. It doesn't have to be terrible. Uh, so leading with the question of what are you looking for out of this helps. If you're doing it in a uh, sort of freelance situation, it's a little bit easier. There's some guardrails. So generally, you just have the conversation. Uh, up front about you know hey here's what we need out of this nine times out of ten they didn't even get that information when they were writing so a lot of the editing is going to come as a shock and surprise because everyone was off base but the um i guess the biggest thing to keep in mind is whether people have adhd or not a lot of times in freelance um they didn't know what they were doing anyway, and you didn't know what you were doing. You were all kind of feeling it out together. If you are patient with that and lean into that reality, you will at least not get in horrible fights. It may still take you longer to get where you need to be to hit your deadlines, but um, but you will wind up still friends at the end and with someone who is able to learn something and be a better be a better writer or be a better editor in future. I don't know if that is helpful or addresses the question, but yeah. While Darla is typing, I will add the generosity. Oh, sorry, good. Yep. For freelance work, I don't tend to disclose. I do everything online. But like Rabbit said, I need to know what the expectations are. What am I editing specifically for? Mostly just look for specificity and expectations. But that isn't an ADHD or autism specific question. So long as you both understand what the expectations are. Yep. And Darla has hit it right on the head. Generosity and clarity are like the two most critical rules. And that's, uh, it helps the ADHD, absolutely. And for ADHD, you might want to like explicitly over communicate and explicitly uh, make sure you're checking in more often and explicitly make sure you are making it clear that you don't hate them because they're they're running late. Um, mm -hmm. But those are good practices with anyone. So uh, it's curb cutting. The treating yeah. people like human beings works for everybody. Well, what I'd say, if you are a publisher and you're working with freelance writers, uh, some of whom, whether they have ADHD or not, but even more important if they do have ADHD is well, publishers or project leads on a book, because a lot of times, depending on who you're working with, it'll all be conflated. Uh, is clarity of expectation and what it is you're looking for also as much of an outline as you can give and as much of guardrails as you can give? Because your ADHD writer is definitely going to come up with a really cool idea that may be a million miles from what you wanted in the first place. Sometimes you know yourself to know if, you're going to be happy with that. And you're like, hey, yes, I want my writers to extrapolate or no, my vision is really specific. I want some really specific things and I need you to stay within those guidelines. Yep. And know like, yourself even, well enough. Yeah. And even things as mundane as word count. I mean, um, mm -hmm. communicate upfront your expectations about word count, both above and below. Um, there are tons of writers out there. And again, lines up with ADHD and hyperfocus who will overwrite and their stuff will be great. It might be amazing. But um, if you have, you know, a word count of 2000, because you need to fit it into a certain number of pages, uh, then them coming back with 5000 words has just made life hard for everybody. Hello, kitty. Hey. Um, yeah. on, on that note, we have a question about 
Well, ask, asking what is game poetry, and kind of on the note, it sounds like, uh, Darla and Rabbit, you've talked about other mediums that you've worked in. Like, how does, I, I, we'd like to know what game poetry is, but how does working uh, on games differ from working on other types of mediums? Yeah. Okay, so game poetry, secondary world fiction, basically. It is uh, usually a text prop or something. There was one in um, Fizzband's um, DNA thing. I think it was like Song of First World or something. But it is uh, setting text presented in a poetic format. It's supposed to be poetry that is in the fictional world that you're doing. Um, I wrote an awful lot of it when we were running Dust to Dust LARP. Uh, an awful lot of it. Uh, uh, LARPs can, especially campaign LARPs, can have a lot of it because you're trying to, you know, build a consistent world. Um, but uh, uh, maybe this is my agile agilist talking, but I don't find a lot of differences between, say, writing for games, working in software, or... Um, writing, say, fiction or short stories, except that really nobody is going to be following up behind you if you're writing fiction or short stories, unless you are established enough that you have an agent on your butt. Um, so that one is a lot harder to me than uh, than any of the other things. A game, I hope that answers the question. And continuity with other material, so you need to know the lore and maintain the language and style of the game. But editing patient education materials for a hospital means translating complex terminology into plain language. Yeah, that's really good. That's a that's a good description. Also, um. So how are game, how's it how's it different at different outside of games? Yeah, essentially this is about game design and the struggles of public designing and publishing with ADHD, but how does that differ given games are often systemic or have different are more about rules than necessarily writing? Oh, I mean, no writing's also about systemic and about rules. So yeah. no. Are there yeah. differences? I was saying there's there's not a lot of differences except um, I think in, for me in writing games, you have more opportunities for external accountability than a lot of other kinds of writing, uh, unless you are writing for a job, for example. Um, but if you're just writing fiction, um, a lot of times it's harder to have that external um, accountability, in part because you can, you know, uh, get people to read your story or whatever, and it to me, it actually feels more awful. I, I have a harder time with that than, uh, hey, play test my game, or you know, I'll run a game and it's this thing that I wrote. That's usually easier to feel like I'm getting people interested. On that note, then, I think we have a final question that was specifically that, but with games where one of the, it seems, uh, Free Jung has problems with social anxiety when playtesting games with all of the complexity of working with other people, what happens during a playtest, how to start something and then follow through with it, and isn't sure about how to get over those hurdles that you say are easier with games. And so do you have any suggestions there? Uh, in, in terms of running a playtest uh, for, for others with the game that you've written? Yeah, the social anxiety of it, the planning that has to go into it. Because um, um, you said, yeah. Yeah, for, for me, it's that's hard. easier. I really enjoy being being a game runner. Um, but yeah, that's hard. I you know ran something I wrote at Metatopia two years ago that I have barely touched since. So, eh, so yes, I say it's easier, but the follow through um, uh, can be a problem and um, the social anxiety is hard if you, you know, don't already have people that you can do for that. Uh, coming to something like Metatopia is probably the absolute best thing um, yep. that 
that I can think since it's explicitly a playtesting con where you have people who are eager and want to do that. If you can at all make something like that happen, that's that's really the best resource if you otherwise have social anxiety. Unfortunately, there are not good tools, but here's your million dollar app idea um, to uh, set up playtests for works in progress um, for people who don't have an easy group of friends. Or, uh, or, yeah, Darla. It's hard and nerve wracking. I ran a playtest last year at Metatopia, and it was hard. But it was worth it. I just tried to run it like a game session and look for the cracks, look for where things were inconsistent or didn't flow well in play. But also, I'm medicated for my anxiety. That helps a lot. Uh, so, yeah. all right, I'm going to. I'm going to make a tactical suggestion on that front because it is super hard. Um, but playtesting is a gift. It is it is a a generosity on people's part, and even the mm -hmm. harshest feedback is a kindness. And it is easy to say that and very hard to believe it internally. Um, and in order to internalize that, I strongly suspect that uh, at least for me and for a lot of a lot of folks, one of the best things you can do is help other people playtest. Do that for a while. Playtest other people's games. Give feedback. Get into that. And that will help you understand what it looks like from the other side and that the things that you might otherwise feel defensive about or, or overly criticized about are actually coming from a place of generosity and care and concern and investment. Because once you get that that's what's going on, that offsets a lot of the, oh God, they hate my game and therefore they hate me, I'm a trash person, uh, I'm going to go live in Tibet. Well, this thank is, you. Yep. As you say, this is why it's so important that designers at Metatopia also play test other games. Yes. Check out the page that lists all of the playtests happening. They keep being added. There's more and more. Thank you all so much for this. If you want to go last round and reintroduce yourselves so everyone on the panel knows. Awesome. Uh, hi, I'm Rob uh, from Evil Hat and Twitter, and I talk a lot. Rabbit? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm Rabbit Codlock on Twitter from various and sundry freelance projects like Talisman, and uh, and yeah, I'm here. And Darla, we should have just had you have that one saved up for a repeat. Uh, Darla Burrow, check out my latest game, Dear Great Cthulhu. Please stop giving me superpowers on itch.io. Check me out on Twitter. <laughs> Okay, the cadence of that turning it into stop giving me superpowers on itch.io like makes me imagine <laughs> an entirely different game, and I, I now kind of think that game needs to exist. Wonderful. Oh, and of course, uh, pet names. <laughs> oh, yes. Names, oh, yes. Names of our pets. No, no, the cats. We, we had some guest stars. We color. need to know. Uh... We had guest stars. Big fluffy cat was the flu. <laughs> <laughs> And hello again. Well, wonderful. It was amazing to have all of you on. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And thank you, imaginary thank you. people out there who were just kind of trusting exist. There's there's some people here. OK, we We've believe had a you. Bunch of <laughs> okay. Peace. Take care, folks. <laughs>